I love people so much that it, it's hard for me to be alone. I have music. It keeps me glued to life. Wow. Writer, co-writer, director, star, co-producer. This was a passion project for you. I mean, right from the time you were eight years old and got a baton for your uh, for Christmas. Can you just say how you got into directing this? I really found something that I felt finally after 20 some years in this business that I was at my center, which was sort of writing and directing movies. And I knew I had a huge furnace uh, with this obsession with fake conducting uh, uh, for many years. <laughs> And, um, and then I just started to, he, and then J I asked Josh Singer to come aboard and let's just see if there's a movie that I think that maybe that I could have a point of view about. And in researching these incredible characters who, who Carrie so wonderfully played as Felicia Montalegre. <laughs> right? A movie that I found utterly compelling to explore about this relationship of these two people that was haunting and inspiring and funny and, and, and tragic and human. And uh, that was when I knew that, oh, this is a movie I could make. The three Bernstein uh, kids uh, who were behind this, warts and all, I like to say, they, they didn't leave anything off limits in this. That's absolutely correct, and there is no movie without them. They were, they were an integral part of the whole writing process. They weren't around at all for the shooting, we keep that very close. But then in the post process as well, I would, I would send them they would come over to my house and I would show them cuts of the film or scenes and they were they were wonderful. They were and and we couldn't be at the Venice Film Festival, but people had sent us videos because they came, they went they were conducting the overture at the end during the credits with such joy after this movie. And I, I that was I felt like we had fulfilled our task. That was really uh, that was better than being there. Felicia, uh, I didn't really know much about her, but she obviously was a public figure and an actress. Um, what did you learn? What was the challenging uh, thing about bringing her to life? Well, the first time Bradley and I met was in 2018 to talk about this. And in that uh, coffee, he said he wanted to make a film about marriage. That was sort of how he wanted to tell the story. The music would be a part of this love story, this kind of impossible love story. It was the idea of what it would be like to be two artists living together and making a life together, one of whom was sort of once in a generation touched by God talent and the other whom was a very good actress and what that must have felt like and, and the decision that she ultimately made to to make Lenny her art, you know, for him to become the center of her life. What I thought was so striking from the offset was the way that Bradley and Josh Singer had been able to write this role for a woman um, so unbelievably truthfully um, and uh, with so much complexity and richness, but that was just, it was just shockingly brilliant writing. Um, and then all the other incredible benefits of getting to work with an actor like this. There's one scene that I still can't get out of my head. The Macy's Parade and you have Snoopy, the big float, <laughs> going behind you, where you would think the audience's eye would go, what the hell <laughs> is that? And it's all on you two as this scene builds and builds. It was the third take. It's one single take and it was the third take of, the, of that setup. And then that was it. We, we, we went home after that. It was an early day. <laughs> um, and, and it was really because of, of, of Carrie being able to run, drive that scene under these very specific circumstances. And that's your dream as a filmmaker, to be able to dream cinematically as big as you can for a story and then have actors be able to fulfill that. That's, you know, that's what you pray for. I've been trying to explain what it's like to be directed by your co-star. And, um, <laughs> you know, that... Bradley did the most extraordinary thing that I'm still trying to get my head around. It was sort of like a Jedi mind thing, but that, that he would be able to, as Lenny, elicit the response he wanted in me by adjusting his performance. And, you know, very rarely was he giving me verbal notes, but they were always in character, but that so often in his performance, he would alter how ultimately I would respond. And so in that third take, it was the way Lenny walked into the room. It was the way he kept his sunglasses on. It was the way he had a carton of milk. I mean, it was all just there, you know? And it was like, oh, he wants a fight, you know? <laughs> um, so it was, it was, it was, he was directing me through his work, which, is, which was incredible. The work here was over the course of several years, actually, in creating um, Leonard Bernstein's uh, makeup, prosthetic design, and everything. Can you talk a little bit about this? 
<laughs> so the uh, you know Leonard Bernstein was a big inspiration for me when I just started this job like 36 years ago, and <laughs> uh, you know I, I wanted to do a film about him someday. You know that's uh, that moment really? I thought yeah because it's uh, <laughs> he's so iconic. Almost his face kind of oozed with his passion and commitment, and I can I could see that what's behind it, and so. You know, like uh, uh, why when I started to work on this project, uh, the, I was thinking, what drives me working so hard every day? You know, last 36 years, and I, I realized it's almost like a get ready for this show. And Bradley brought that, you know, g biggest gift to me. It really reminded me the love to the people and the crew and the filmmaking is uh, such an amazing experience it was. And we spent years, years uh, working on this, and I would go to his house and spend all day long, and we would just constantly refine it and talk about it and send photos and talk on the phone about it, and then we would test it. We, we had a, a, so much footage of testing of Lenny to make sure I didn't look like an SNL sketch conducting. We were Gustavo Dudamel was kind enough uh, and the LA Phil to open up Disney Hall, and we did tests there. And um, we just kept, it, our goal was the same, to make a human being. I actually had to call my friends at Netflix and say, is that really Bernstein or is that Bradley again? Because I could not tell. And, and it's not a mask that you put on. You can see your eyes, it so embodies him completely, but it's you. It's like, it's just amazing. I love the end of the movie, too, because uh, you, the character of, of Lenny is throughout the whole film, and it's his music. And, and the hope is that you, when we see this iconic figure at the end, Leonard Bernstein conducting, and then you see it's music by him, that you feel that, oh, actually, I know this person now after this film. That, that was the goal, that you don't see sort of this Leonard Bernstein. You're like, I actually n know what's going on inside of him as he's conducting. Michelle, how did you work with Bradley to create this? Because there's a lot of uh, tricks here that uh, are not easy, I don't think. You know, sometimes you can you work on a project and you're like, I did that, or he said this, or whatever. But it's, I feel like every cut was together. We we decided things together, and. I mean, we it, it's meant to be very seamless. I mean, I always think of, like, this is not a musical, but this mu movie is musical. You know, down to the performances, the camera work, and, I mean, the way Bradley created a lot of these transitions or designed them and shot it that way, that, you know, really the job of editorial was to try to create, you know, a musical flow throughout the entire film, and it's really across scenes and across sequences that, you know, we try to land in, in, in important moments in their relationship. The only reason why we change uh, time periods is because, again, that anchor of the movie is about this marriage. And in order to tell the story, we had to cross decades, five decades. And early on, when I spoke to everybody, it was about, we're not, we're, we're going to do that in a way where there's not, it's not going to say 1966 or 1971. Yeah. We have to do it with how the movie feels. And also never wanting the audience to be outside of the film, always immersed. That's why the one three three aspect ratio, uh, and it's always depth. And that comes down to creating a world that Kevin Thompson and his team created. Uh, Kevin, you know, the Dakota does not allow cameras in there at all, ever. And so how did you recreate this, go about doing that set in particular? It doesn't allow movie shooting, but it allowed me to take pictures with my iPhone. And, ah. and, and I was able to get my team members in uh, to measure basic uh, overall scale dimensions and details of the woodwork and things like that. So, we, But I think it, it was important for Bradley and I just to walk through the apartment and talk about where we are in the movie with these two characters and their relationship and what the Dakota meant to them and their family at that time. And we walked through the apartment and we talked about how s subtle adjustments should be made to the plan um, to work better for how Bradley wanted to shoot it. So we discussed that and then, and then it was, it's a dream of mine um, to be able to build a set like that and have it be more than just a tangible reproduction of an apartment, but something that carried the emotional core of what was gonna happen there. 
again, all this, uh, the, the opportunity of having so much time, so many years of prep. So I would walk in. I mean, I went to that. The, the owner of the Dakota was so nice. I went there maybe four times before we went. I was able to go on Thanksgiving Day and see how they sort of entertained there, which gave me so many ideas. With, with the house, it was, I mean, I was there half a dozen times and I fell in love with it and wrote much of the movie, you know, in the black and white era and the color of this home. Same thing with Ely Cathedral. We had to go to Ely Cathedral where Lenny did, uh, you know, conduct Mahler's Second Symphony, The Resurrection with the London Symphony Orchestra in the 70s. Mark, talk about uh, the costume design here and what your biggest challenge was too. I understand they actually wore, went into the closet and wore some of the real stuff that... Uh... Uh, uh, yeah, one of uh, Carrie's uh, costumes was one of Felicia's real dresses uh, that she wears at the country house and Jamie was very generous and loaned it to us and it w went right on Carrie and I think it adds to the scene with its energy of of Felicia there somehow. And it was also something very typically that she would wear. So, um, you know, we, Bradley and I poured over tons of images and, and uh, looked at what maybe would work for the beats of a lifetime. Different eras that you had to go through in one movie here and make it Believable. That was that was the most exciting part of it, really, is go from 1943 to 1989, and and try to tell a story with a, a shoulder pad or a hemline or a shape of a trouser, texture for the black and white, using colors judiciously throughout the color sequence, just everything with the goal of telling the story. Thanks for sticking. <laughs> Thank you Thank so you. much for coming Thank out you. here to the Thank Academy you. tonight. Thank Thanks, guys. Thank you.